Shame is what is getting so many men into burnout and keeping them stuck in it and also keeping them away from intimacy. So I didn't find a term though that really captured shame in in the specific way that I wanted to. So social comparison shame is a term that I started to use to recognize that we're constantly measuring ourselves against the next guy, against the next rung on the ladder. It's a fruitless effort. On this episode of the Creator Community, we'll meet Jim Young, a men's burnout coach that built his business to solve many of the challenges he faced as a corporate executive. We'll hear Jim's story of overcoming his own burnout journey and how his work has now turned his thinking on traditional tough guys on its head. We'll follow Jim's story that led him to an improv class and how he's been able to apply those lessons to his coaching business to help leaders evolve and grow through having a few laughs. We'll also learn Jim's views on key challenges men face today with burnout and what they can do to take a step back, improve relationships across their lives and their health. And we'll learn how all this led him to his first book, Expansive Intimacy, How Tough Guys Defeat Burnout. Check out the show. Welcome to the Creator Community. This is a podcast from book publisher, New Degree Presser, NDP. I'm your host, John Saunders. This show is designed to celebrate, elevate, and showcase many of the incredible authors that have published their books with NDP. This year, NDP will cross over 1,500 published authors from six continents and has earned the 293rd spot on the Inc. 5000 list. This is the fastest growing privately held companies in America. If you've ever thought of writing a book but weren't sure where to start or finish, visit creator.institute to learn more. This is episode six of season five, and today I have with me Jim Young. Jim leverages his experiences as a corporate leader, executive coach, facilitator, speaker, and improv comedian to open hearts and change minds. His new book, Expansive Intimacy, How Tough Guys Defeat Burnout, helps men create a roadmap for more fulfilling lives. You can learn more about his work at thecenteredcoach.com. Jim, great to see you. Thanks for being on the creator community. John, thanks for having me. It's always a good time to talk to you. I can't wait to dive in today. I really appreciate it. You know, when you think about your journey, it is, I'm going to go ahead and call it non-linear. And, you know, you've had all these interesting backgrounds. You had success in corporate America, and now you've gone out on your own and even find time for a little improv. You know, share with us a little bit about your career journey and how you landed where you you are. Sure. It really started in a funny sort of way. I was selling cable TV door to door right after college. I did not hit the ground running after college and kind of fumbled my way through some really odd jobs for a few years before landing in IT because of Y2K. Big law firm in Boston said, we need bodies. I got to be one of them. And I launched this IT career that was really engaging and fun for almost 25 years. And I kept growing in it. Like, got a chance to learn a bunch of stuff about technology, but then I got to be a manager and a director and I climbed the ladder moving through different organizations and loved so much of it. The only problem was I kind of hit a wall several different times throughout the way. And eventually, I know we'll get to more of this later on, eventually in 2018, I decided to reinvent myself and I left corporate America to get into coaching and facilitation, which is are my twin passions and really love what I get to do today. So this, this journey was definitely nonlinear. There was a section of it in the middle that was the classic story that I think I was supposed to follow. And the problem was it didn't ever really fit. Wow. And what was it like for you? What was that moment of discovery like? How do you figure out it wasn't a fit? I wish it were a moment because that would have been a lot cleaner than what I experienced. <laughs> I think that my journey into the morass that turned into into burnout was years long. I think there was probably a five to seven year stretch of going into being in at various phases along that spectrum, and then finally making my way out. And a lot of it was me trying to meet all the shoulds of the world, what I should have followed for a path, all the expectations that were on me. And I kept having success at doing it. I was really good at taking on all of those things, all those responsibilities and roles and leading, but I was starving myself on the inside. So it was, it was a really protracted sense of depletion over a long period of time. It sounds pretty painful. And that's what I think inspired you to come out and 
one, start the work that you do and, and put this book together. So how, how did this author coaching program land on your radar screen and, and how did you fit it into your life? Yeah, I part of what I've done over the last four years since I've created my own company and, and struck out on my own is learn to rebuild colleagueship. And I've met lots of people over the years, and in particular, a couple of different realms through coaching communities and also through men's groups and men's work. And there are two men in particular who are authors who've written books through the Creator Institute that I connected with and I heard about their experiences. And I said, oh, that's really cool. Like, I, I got to check that out. And as soon as I talked to Eric about the, the program, I realized like, oh my God, this is amazing. I love community cohort-based learning. I really knew there was something I wanted to write about. And so I, I said, all right, let's go. I'll, I'll I'll figure out how to fit it in. And I had created space to be able to do this kind of work in, in recent years. So it fit in really nicely. That's awesome. So uh, referencing, of course, Eric Custer, the founder of this, this institute and this program, and not unlike a lot of people that have landed here, they had a friend or a colleague do it and referred them to it. What was the experience like for you? How do you take an idea and turn it into a book? How did that happen? I got to say, I'm still kind of shocked that it's <laughs> Less than a year since I had that first phone call with Eric to talk about the idea of, of writing a book. And I was ready. So I, writing was, at first, I could put a lot of information out, but I got so much great guidance from my developmental editor, from the classes that I was going through to learn how to take all these thoughts and ideas and put them into something that could then be a book. And I think one of the things I really loved about it was that it got to be messy. I was allowed to create something that wasn't perfect and that I got to iterate over it. And then I got tons of feedback, which was huge for me. I used to never want any feedback. And I loved all the different touch points that I got to help me create a book that I couldn't have created on my own. The process, the coaching, the structure, the community. And it sounds like a, a natural fit for the experiences you've had in life already being a part of a number of groups. Yeah. You know. It's a pretty vulnerable experience putting your content out there, right? What was it like first starting to put your content out there? How did that make you feel to get feedback on it? Yeah, at first it was a bit uncomfortable. It's been something I've been working on for years is to try and be more comfortable with, with vulnerability. And, and this was a new level for me. What I learned was that there are going to be a lot of people who love what I have to say. There are going to be people who don't get what I have to say. And there are going to be people who aren't interested or don't like what I have to say. And I don't need to please them all, but I get to listen to all that feedback and say, huh, am I making sense? Am I putting something out there that's compelling? Because ultimately I want to help people and I only have one perspective. So I need their input. I need to be able to take that and say, oh, let me fold that in too, so that I can be of most service to, to the most people. What an incredibly thoughtful way to go about that feedback in this journey and ultimately create a better book and help so many that you can with, with your content. But it is hard putting that content out that I remember making my first announcement saying, when I wrote my book in 20, at the end of 2020 or published end of 2020, the first time I put, made a post about it on LinkedIn, it, I was a nervous wreck. Yeah. It was really scary to say, I'm creating something and announcing that to the world. And, and so it sounds like you had a similar experience, but I love that you embrace and, and really own the feedback and see it as a learning experience rather than something to be defensive about. Yeah. And one of the things I really embraced that I got repeated throughout the course of book creators and also with New Degree Press was that great books aren't written, they're rewritten. And that means that I can't do it myself. I actually need other people to be part of that process because I, I could write it over and over again, but I don't know if that's any different than me just writing it. The rewriting to me had to involve multiple voices. Such a great quote. No one's first draft manuscript is their final book ever. And that's a big myth we spend a lot of time dispelling around here. I love that you picked up on that. So your book, Expansive Intimacy, right? You can't have intimacy without some level of vulnerability. So I think a pretty good segue here, you know, how tough guys, expansive, expansive intimacy, how tough guys defeat burnout. So what's the book about you? Yeah, if we parse it, we can start with burnout. That was what I started with. I wanted to write a story about my own burnout and how I managed to get through it. And I specifically wanted to write about it from the male perspective. It's a great book by Amelia and Emily Nagoski on burnout for women. That was one of my influences. And I realized there wasn't one for men. 
And so as I started to deconstruct it, I said, well, what got me out of burnout was creating all of these intimate connections across my life, expansive intimacy, which isn't just this narrow slice of an intimate romantic partner that we typically think of that as meaning. Instead, it's with my colleagues, it's with my friends, it's with my children, it's with my romantic partner, it's with my ex-wife, it's with everybody in my life. I get to have some level of intimacy. And that where tough guys comes into that is that it's tough to do that as a man, given what we've been asked to do, what we've been told are the expectations. We're not supposed to be vulnerable or reveal our emotions or feel like we need help. And expansive intimacy flips that on its head and says, that's the tough thing to do. And actually the reward of it is that we get to put burnout at the end of the list. It's not going to be the thing that consumes us. We get to enjoy all of those relationships instead. So reframing intimacy as we often think about it, right? Typically with a romantic partner, but thinking about it across all your relationships, having them deeper and more meaningful. And I think enriching everybody in the circumstance along the way, right? What did it feel like when you first found yourself with burnout at the end of the list, as you just said? That's pretty, pretty amazing. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that burnout was this murky journey for me over several years. And just as it was murky on the way in, because I was making thousands of tiny decisions that got me there, I had to wend my way out of that in a similar way. And it took me a while to realize I wasn't burned out. It was really in the last two years that I recognized that I was like, oh, I still have the exact same stressors coming at me financially. I've, I have three teenagers, right? I have stress in my life. I have you know, job stress. I have family stress. I have all the same things that were always going on, but they don't affect me as much anymore because I have all of these places to go to. I have these rich relationships that I can bring those stresses to. I can also bring my celebrations to them, by the way. It's not just about expansive intimacy isn't just an antidote. It's, I have this place to take everything in my life to a friend, to a colleague, to my partner, to my kids. And it doesn't all build up. I get to, you know, I get to let it flow through me. I love that story and how, you know, you've just gone through this journey yourself. Now you're sharing it with so many others and talk about a life-changing circumstance for you. That's incredible. Uh, you, know, you, you, you use quotes around the term tough guys in the subtitle. Like what's What's, what's that about? Yeah, it's about the archetype that we've been given in our culture around what it is to be a man. And we're supposed to be tough. We're supposed to stand there and take it on the chin. We're supposed to be stoic. And I don't think that's particularly tough anymore, right? Like, sure, yeah, you take a shot. You can absorb stress all day long, but it's not sustainable. And you look at what actually happens in those conditions. You look at some of the rates of addiction, heart disease, depression, suicide for men as they go through life, they're pretty scary. And I think that's a direct response to just absorbing all of that stuff for so long. That's not tough. You're not helping out the people around you. The tough thing to do for somebody, for a man in our culture is to say, man, I need help. I can't handle this. I'm afraid. Or I'm super excited. I have joy. We're not even supposed to have joy. What's up with that? I mean, come on. So you know, I want to reframe tough guys as being our full selves, not just this rigid statue that stands there and absorbs whatever life throws at it. Like, how is that stigma still sort of hanging around in this day and age we live in? What, what, are, what are your observations there from working with so many people now as a coach? I see it loosening in particular with younger generations. My, my son is 17, and I think he's very different than I was at 17. He's far more aware of his emotions and free to express them. And maybe, you know, some of that I'm sure I'll, I'll take credit for as a parent, and I'll give you know, credit to his mom as well. But I think it's also cultural. I think we're, you know, we're just conditioned to what we saw before us. And if we go a couple generations ahead, the greatest generation, the, the boomer generation, for me, I'm a Gen Xer is I saw that hard work was the path to success. I saw that material acquisition was the path to success. I saw that providing and protecting those roles that go back to, you know, eons were part of who I needed to be. And I don't need to throw all that stuff away. There are good elements to that. I just need to round it out. And so I, I think we're, you know, we're, we're moving in that direction. And there's, there's something in there that was a huge part of the book, which I hope we'll talk about which is there's a shame factor that comes in when we say, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to be different. 
I love this idea that you have this ability to, as you said, you know, you're not changing your life entirely. You're still taking on the same challenges, still having the same successes and rewards, but you found a better way to deal with them. You worked in corporate America all these years, had the success, found yourself burnt out, and now you find yourself working with these people and corporate, you know, corporate leaders as a, as a coach. Why do you focus there? What's the what's that about? I think we've stopped listening to the old, you know, air quotes here, church and state as the most important institutions in our culture that we've, and there's some statistics that back that up around religious affiliation and participation and around trust in government. They're at all time lows where we're getting so much of the influence in our lives is through the business world, whether that's as consumers of it or participants in it. And we have cultures that are creating burnout workplace. Burnout is by world health organization definition, a condition triggered by unmanaged workplace stress that results in exhaustion, cynicism, and a lack of a sense of efficacy. I want to side note that it's not just a workplace issue. It can happen as a, a parent or a solo entrepreneur. But if we look at where the impact is, it's in the workplace. That's where so many people spend the majority of their waking hours. And if our leaders aren't looking at that and changing the conditions, that system is going to continue to create burnout. So I want to work with leaders to help them say, we can address this and we have an important role. In fact, we have probably the most key role in changing that. Right. And if you can work with leaders, of course, it's going to you know, flow down to their team, right? And create better cultures, better environments where everybody can live in a less burnout state. What a, what a great strategy and a great mission to help so many. You, know, you mentioned shame a minute ago. In, in your book, you call it social comparison shame. What, what is that about? And what are some of the consequences you've seen there? As a backdrop, when I started writing the book, I knew I wanted to write about my burnout journey. And I knew that I had discovered that expansive intimacy was the antidote. And there was absolutely no part of me that wanted to write about shame. And it kept coming up as this giant thing in the middle. It was like the troll that lived under the bridge and I had to go past it. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't avoid it. And what I saw was that shame is what is getting so many men into burnout and keeping them stuck in it and also keeping them away from intimacy. So I didn't find a term though, that really captured shame in, in the specific way that I wanted to. So social comparison shame is a term that I started to use to recognize that we're constantly measuring ourselves against the next guy, against the next rung on the ladder. It's a fruitless effort. We can never outdo the next guy. You know, you look at the sports world. I'm a sports fan. You see, I need a $400 million contract. Oh, well now I need a $500 million contract. It's, it's silliness, but it's rooted in this research actually called social ranking theory, where we look to our peers to say, am I higher status? We can never win. And so we keep doubling down. We keep trying. And what we end up in is shame when we realize like, I didn't, I fell short. I wasn't man enough. I didn't achieve the status that that, that other guy did. So, so when that happens, what have you seen some of the consequences for these people? One of the key things is let me just outwork it. Let me double down. I'm going to be quiet about it. I don't want anybody to know that I feel this way because that would be shameful in itself. I can't admit it. So what do I need to do? Do I need to work a hundred hour a week instead of an 80 hour a week? Do I, you know, I need to keep proving myself and we can't continue to do that because what happens is we, when we focus that much time. And I say this a lot from personal experience, right? This is my story as well, is that when we focus so hard on that achievement through our work, everything else falls away. I lost a marriage. I lost a lot of friendships. I gave up hobbies that I loved doing for years. I became so isolated and focused on this one thing to try and succeed that the rest of my life started to crumble around me. And that's an extreme case, but there are a lot of examples. I see it come to me all the time with my coaching clients. I ask them, how many friends do you have? And they're like, yeah, and I don't have any right now. Right. Because they're so focused on their careers or that, that thing that they're after. Yeah, yeah, the golden ring or whatever they're 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 aiming to to grab so that they can say like, yeah, I did it. I, I accomplished what I was supposed to. You know, there's an author from this program a couple of cohorts ago, Mark Moskowitz. I think I'm getting his name right. He spent time in one of the upstate federal penitentiaries for embezzling clients from a hedge fund that he ran. Uh -huh. And he, one of the stories he shared with me. <clears throat> In that journey was when he sat in that federal penitentiary, one of these kind of sort of low security prisons in upstate New York, it was filled with white collar crime guys. And basically this shame, social shame comparison. I mean, there were guys in there that came in with worth 
tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, and wow. they were pulling these same, it didn't matter how many zeros were on their account. If their friend built a bigger house in the Hamptons, they were they were going to add a 5,000 foot addition out of theirs, no matter what it took. Yeah. And it turned into embezzling. And the one guy that was in there that was never going to get out, he was in his 70s or 80s, was embezzling from his elderly clients to do this kind of stuff. And he was making 20 plus million dollars a year. Un talk about social comparison shame at a maximum. Unbelievable. So you've done this work in improv comedy, right? So you expand another book and social responsibility. What's, what's the link between these things that you see? About seven years ago, I discovered improv comedy as one of my first places that I started to learn about different ways that I could be where I stepped into this community. I could just show up on the stage as myself. Nobody knew who I was. So I could just be myself. And I started to learn the rules of improv. And I use that term loosely, that we accept each other, that we agree to the offers, that our job is to make our scene partner look great. It's the only job we have and their job is the same. So we have this, these conditions where things open up and I don't have to be the guy who has the answers. I don't have to be responsible. I just have to be an equal member of the team. And I started to realize how much fun it was, how much I discovered I got, I was encouraged to play through an emotional point of view. So I had to really expand my range there of like, how do I feel? I had to ask myself that question. I got to feel it in scenes where I was like, oh my God, I actually felt sad or happy or some other, you know, more nuanced emotion. And as I started to, to build that more into my life, it turned into this approach that became expansive intimacy of, I can do this everywhere. I can be myself in all of these places, the authentic version of me who's goofy, who's serious, who's smart, who's confused, any of those things, and trust that my scene partner is going to be able to handle it, whether the scene partner is my kid or you or a colleague. And as I've gone further with that and my career has taken more sharper focus, I've realized that what I care a lot about is social responsibility. How do we take care of each other on a broader level? Because our world needs it right now in really big ways. And there are some gifts in things like improv comedy and in expansive intimacy that I think can help us heal and come a lot closer together. So what are some of those things? That's incredible that you found this pattern across these three things. <laughs> improv comedy, expansive intimacy, and social responsibility. And what really strikes me about that story you just shared is many times you talked about having all these different emotions and being able to show them to people throughout your life and your relationships. And many people might see that as showing yourself as not confident or being weak, right? And I would argue what could be a great example of being confident, right? Than being able to show yourself like that. That is really powerful. So what what are some of the things that you've seen that that how this how these things can play out and be applied to life? I'll give an example from a recent experience uh, over the past few weeks. I've done a couple of workshops in a leadership development program for a, a Fortune 20 company, a very large brand. And they wanted somebody who could come in and help their leaders understand emotional intelligence and inclusive leadership. And they asked me to come in and I delivered that curriculum where we were working on all sorts of things like our empathy and our emotional expression, our emotional self-awareness and assertiveness and this whole range of emotional skills based on emotional intelligence. But we we're also bringing in things like DEI concepts of how do we welcome other people and how do we honor other people's background and perspective. And we did it all through improv. So we used something called applied improv where we take the gifts of improv comedy and deliver embodied training in low stakes environment where people are laughing their way through learning. And then we come up for air and we see what were the lessons and they're powerful and they stick and people have muscle memory now that they've practiced when they go out into the high stakes world of their, their working world as a leader, that they can become a more inclusive leader. They can use their emotional intelligence and they can have maybe even a little fun doing it. What a powerful way to connect the dots on all these things for people that you've worked with and these leaders who I'm sure are all standing somewhere in and around the precipice of burnout, if not into it. And you had this moment, this exercise to take them out of that moment, kind of get to be a kid again and have a little fun. We forget to have fun sometimes in our careers. And that gives you this chance to sort of explore and see things from other perspectives, right? And not be afraid because you get to play this role, right? That's brilliant. I absolutely love that idea. And yeah. what was the feedback you got from that workshop? I, I had some people come up to me after the workshop who were just like lit up and then in da the days following share with me on LinkedIn or, or in other, other channels, how that 
that workshop was the most powerful in their three-day leadership training that they did with, you know, and I'm sure all the other stuff was great, but like I had a couple of people like, that was the best thing. That was super, super helpful. It was so applicable. And you know, if I just put a plug into expansive intimacy, that form of play is a great way into connection where we then get to see each other and we get to be like, oh, I know you, you know me, we can trust each other. We can build an intimate connection. So no surprise that that really got these people to think differently because who's taking this approach, right? Let's have a little fun with this. So many times we talk about emotional intelligence and try to think differently, being empathetic becomes this very serious conversation, right? And this is how you're empathetic and do this, right? X, A, B, C. And this is talking about a totally different open-ended approach. I want to give a little credit to a guy named Mick Napier. Mick Napier is a founder of one of the theaters in Chicago that teaches improv and he's worked at Second City for years. He's trained Tina Fey, Stephen Colbert, Chris Farley, the, the you know the stars of the comedy world. And I got to do a, a session with him four years ago. And he told me the nine words that I needed to hear, get out of your head and into your body. And that concept, I use that in that workshop series with them. And I told them, we're, we're not going to intellectualize emotional intelligence and inclusive leadership today. We're going to do it because that's how we're going to learn it. That's amazing. Well done, Mick. So Jim, if I'm listening to this interview and I'm thinking, intimacy, expansive. What do, how do I take the first step? What would you tell that person, that listener? Yeah. I, and in particular, I, I target this book at men, although I think people of any gender are going to find value in it. It's about taking risks. Honestly, we have to look at first, what do I really want? Let me be introspective for a minute and see what's in my life that is either missing or is causing me some kind of distress. And I want something different. I want more of this, less of that. And then say, okay, what's the risk I would have to take in order to make a change? Because that's what we're afraid of. We don't want to change and it requires risk and, and it, it might invite loss and grief and all these things we don't want to handle. But that's where the richness is. Every time I've gone away from the achievement-based approach to trying to feel better and more into the risk of I want to change into the thing that I truly want, I've found reward. It hasn't always been easy, but that's what makes it even more rewarding is that I learn real lessons and I and they're sustainable. It changes me as a person. So I'm not ever back in that circumstance again. Assess your circumstance, see where you really are, create a goal for yourself that's meaningful and take the risk. And it doesn't have to be a huge risk, right? You can sort of test the waters in a number of areas. Is that a fair statement? Take one step, experiment. I, I love putting on the lab coat virtually and saying like, all right, I'm going to try this thing out. And if it doesn't work, I can try something else out. It's not this fixed plan. It's a, it's like improv. I get to adjust and see what happened and then adjust again. I can say with great confidence that thinking about my own career, one of the biggest changes that and I got this advice from a colleague that was having tremendous success. And I asked him, how did you create the success? And he said, I went to my best clients. This is when I was a sales guy on Wall Street a few years ago. And ask them for feedback on what it's like working with me. Yeah. And I remember what he said that this is probably 2011, 2012. I remember thinking, what are you talking about? Who would ever go do that? <laughs> and then after I thought about it, I thought, that's a great idea. And I went and did it. And one of the biggest inflection, certainly I got some feedback I didn't want to hear. So it was a risk and it stung sometimes, but I learned from it. And that's tremendous. And I love this very simple but powerful roadmap you have for others to do the same. Yeah. I'm not creating any magic here. It's just principles. And I love that you have an example of that from your own life. Thank you. So, Writing a book, oftentimes there's some self-learning and obviously you've done a tremendous amount of that already, but what do you think you've learned about yourself along the way with the with the book author journey? As I mentioned before, I, I had this topic of shame come up and I had to really explore that for myself. If I was going to write the book well, I had to go through some of my own shame stories and reconcile those. And it was uncomfortable, but I, I really picked up some, some new learning about myself. And I also learned a lot of practical things as well. I mean, I learned about every topic I wrote in the book. I learned more about burnout. I learned more about shame. I learned more about intimacy and I'll continue to do those. But I also learned, you know, that, that, there are these things that I could do that I didn't realize that I don't have to be perfect and I can create a, a really cool product out of my thoughts. So I can't say enough about, you know, as I was saying earlier, what Book Creators and NDP has done to set me up to, to be able to put something out I never knew I could do. That's awesome. So learned even more so about yourself, learned even more about your topic. I always find that Fascinating. And I hear, I've hear i heard that so many times on this podcast from other authors that they came into this program thinking, I'm going to write this book and I have all the information. And then after they get to the journey, they realize there was a whole lot I didn't know about this topic. And now I know even more about it. And 
can share it and, and help others and many times accelerate how they can do that for others, which is so, so, so cool. So many times, Jim, people see a really, I'll say unexpected positive from their journey from writing the book. What, what's, what's that been like for you? What experiences have you had there? Yeah, something hit me the other day on that. I had, and this is kind of an expansive intimacy story. I, I'd connected with somebody through a network connection months ago. I ended up on their podcast recently. And then one of their network connections posted something on LinkedIn saying, hey, I'm looking for somebody to do a, a virtual workshop on allyship. Anybody know somebody? And I got tagged by this person. And I had a conversation with them and they asked me for a proposal for this work. And whether or not I get it, I have not expected to be a white, able-bodied, straight, middle-class guy doing DEI work. And I've I've kind of backpedaled from that and said, like, wait, 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 I'm not like, I shouldn't be the one doing this. And I've been, I've realized and I've had it reflected back to me by people of color, by women, that we actually need you in the conversation. We, we need people like you to be part of the solution and doing the work to help others come along. So there was no part of me that thought this journey would bring me into equity inclusion work. And it makes perfect sense. I love it. In fact, I had this revelation the other day, just yesterday, the day before that emotional intelligence, expansive intimacy, and equity and inclusion all start with EI. I don't know what to make of that yet, but it seems it seemed kind of magical that uh, those those letters keep coming up and and you know really more seriously i'm just so excited to be able to do work that helps balance the playing field and create conditions that that allow something like expansive intimacy to foster it's a really great perspective you had there thinking like a middle-aged white guy teaching dei to other middle-aged white guys but i think if if i'm hearing you correctly what you allow people to do is is it make it more accessible because these conversations are awkward, particularly if they're coming from someone who's maybe not necessarily look looks like you, if you will. And so that's brilliant. And I love that somebody reached out to you out of the blue on social media and said, hey, you should talk to this Jim Young character about this. Congratulations on that opportunity. I hope it comes through for you. Yeah, thank you. So expansive intimacy, how tough guys defeat burnout. Jim, what's the key message you want readers to take away from your book? that men can flip the narrative that they've been told, that the rules that we've been given are not su sustainable. They lead us to shame, they lead us to burnout. So if we embrace relationships as one of the core, one of the principal measures of our own success, we don't have to throw away all those other definitions of manhood. We need to round them out. We need to bring in the relationships. We need to, to allow other people into the conversation with us, to support us, to celebrate with us. And life gets a lot more richer a lot less difficult. Stop living life in a silo like it seems like we've been groomed to do for so many years, right? And isolation. Feel, feel your, someone the other day said to me, I thought it was brilliant. They said, when you're when you're feeling down on things about whatever it might be, she said, feel these emotions. Paula Doroff said this to me the other day because it's really honoring what it is you're feeling and maybe those impacted by what's happening. I thought that was brilliant, a brilliant way to think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like there's maybe a parallel to what you're talking about. Sure. Uh, that's awesome. So Jim, what's next for you? What are your big goals here for 2022 and beyond now that the book's out here in September? Yeah, they, they jump right off of what we've been talking about today is I want to be talking with more leaders who have that, that potential to create the ripple impact for so many other people. If I can work with you know, 10 or 100 leaders, we could affect thousands or or millions of lives you know, but by getting enough people to say, hey, we can do this differently. So really looking to do more work with, with leaders in bigger settings, speaking, workshops, retreats, things that I've done you know, in the past and bringing it out to more organizations like the ones I've been working with lately. So many lives, I think, can be impacted by this story and such a powerful one. And you know, we've said it before in this chat, simple and powerful, but what you've done and what's so incredible about a book and the process of creating one is not just having a couple of these ideas, but putting them way, putting them together in a meaningful way to help people go through this flow, this process to get them to the other side, flipping the script. As you said, that's that's awesome. Jim, incredible story, incredible lessons for people to take away. Where else can, where can people go to learn more about you and the book? There are a couple of places that I live online. I try to keep it simple. I have a website. It's thecenteredcoach.com. It's where you can find pretty much everything, including my LinkedIn, but that's find me on, on LinkedIn by searching for The Centered Coach as well. 
Well, it sounds like an incredible book. I can't wait to read it. And it looks like somebody else is pretty excited about it as well. Got a great quote here from Sally Clark. Expansive intimacy is a powerful and much needed exploration of the debilitating impact of burnout, especially for men, offering refreshing insights, relatable stories, and practical tips and takeaways you can implement right now. Every man who's struggling with burnout and everyone who leads, works with, or is in a relationship with a man should get their hands on a copy ASAP. Well done, Sally Clark. And from a woman, interestingly enough, for, for a book for men, that's interesting. How did that feel when you got that quote from Sally? Oh, that's amazing because I consider Sally to be a mentor. She's been doing work on burnout. She's in the Netherlands and she is somebody who's written a couple of books on burnout, who leads an organization that's really focused on organizational health. And to, to read those those words from her, you know, really validating that, you know, I've got something good to offer and especially to more than just men. Incredible. Unbelievable story. Great lessons and a roadmap for so many to learn from. Jim, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story with the creator community today. John, thanks so much for having me. Jim's book, Expansive Intimacy, How Tough Guys Defeat Burnout, will be available this September 2022, where everybody books online. Don't forget to subscribe to the Creator Community channel on your favorite podcast platform. If you enjoyed this episode, please share a review. And if you're ready to write your book, visit creator.institute to learn more about the fall 2022 cohort. I'm your host of the Creator Community, John Saunders. Keep creating.